So I reached the conclusion in 1983 that I wanted to use software in freedom. And I had reached more or less these ideas, not every aspect, of course, but the basic part of it. And so I wondered how could I possibly do that? I wanted to have freedom and I wanted to enable other people to have freedom. But that, there was no easy way to, no, it wasn't clear how you could do that at all. Because in 1983, all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. And the computer won't do anything without an operating system. And that meant that if you wanted to get a computer and use it, the second step after buying the computer was to sign a license, a non-disclosure agreement, to get an executable copy of the operating system. So just to get the binaries, you had to promise not to share with anyone and thus betray your whole community. And the source code was essentially unavailable to ordinary users. So it was impossible to use a computer in freedom in a community. What could I do about that? I was one man with no particular fame except in this narrow field of editor development. And I knew that most people didn't agree with this position. So I didn't think I had much chance of starting a mass movement that would convince governments to change their laws or convince companies to change their business practices. But there was another way I could proceed. Instead of convincing anybody to make the existing operating systems free, I could write another one. And that way, I wouldn't have to convince anybody in particular. I just had to write code. And that was my strong point. Operating system development was my field. So I realized I could solve or at least possibly I could solve a social problem by doing technical work. At this point, I realized that here was a major social problem that I was aware of, but that most people had not recognized. I had the skills necessary to try to solve this problem and probably nobody else would do it if I did not. Therefore, I had been elected by circumstances to do this job. It's as if you see someone drowning and you know how to swim and it's not Bush or Il Ducino. <laughs> you know who Il Ducino is? His name is Berlusconi. <clears throat> then you have a moral duty to save that person. Now, I don't know how to swim, but in this case, the job that had to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of code, and that I could do. So I decided I would develop a free operating system or die trying, presumably of old age. Because at the time, the free software movement, which I was just launching, had no active enemies. Lots of people disagreed with us, but they didn't actively try to stop us. They just laughed and said, we, you'll never make a complete free operating system, ha ha. <laughs> and I didn't know if they were right or wrong. Nobody knew at the time if we would ever have a complete free operating system. But I decided to try anyway 
Because when you're fighting for freedom, you can't afford to wait until it's a sure thing. If you wait until it's a sure thing, you lose most of the opportunities and, and you've got no hope at all. You have to try when you don't know if you're going to win. <clears throat> this decision to develop a free software operating system led to other decisions, technical design decisions. What kind of system should it be? Back in the 1980s, there were many different computer architectures. And every year or two, there was a new one. I realized it would take years to finish an operating system. And during that time, the computer architectures could change. Therefore, if I didn't want the system to be obsolete before it was finished, it had to be portable. But there was only one successful portable operating system that I knew of. It was Unix. It was not free software, so we couldn't use it ethically. But it did provide a model of how you could make an operating system portable. So I decided to follow the design of Unix. And that way, have a better chance of making a portable system that would really work. Further, since Unix was popular, especially in academia, I decided to make this system upward compatible with Unix. That way, all the people who already used Unix could easily switch. However, that decision had an interesting consequence because Unix consists of many hundreds of components that communicate through interfaces that were more or less documented. And the users use the same interfaces. So, in order to be compatible with Unix, that means keeping the same interfaces, which means replacing each component one by one. Therefore, all the initial design decisions had been made. We could just look for people to replace each component of Unix independently. Therefore, the only thing that we needed in order to start the project was a name. In the community of programmers who shared our soft we shared our software in the 1970s, where I learned that free software was a good way of life, we programmed mainly for joy. Some of us were students, and the rest mostly were employees, but that was all a side issue. The real reason for our programming was joy. And so we often gave our programs funny names or even mischievous names, because thinking of the users laughing at the name of the program is half the fun. And we had a specific tradition that when you are writing a program which is similar to or compatible with some existing program, you can give your program a name which is a recursive acronym that says that this program is not the other one. For instance, in 1975, as part of that community, I developed the first Emacs text editor. It's an extensible programmable text editor. You can reprogram the editor during the editing session. And people liked it so much that there were 30 imitations of Emacs, and many of them were called something Emacs. But some, the ones that were done by hackers usually, were called, one was called Fine, for Fine is not Emacs. And then there was sign for sign is not Emacs. And then there was Ina for Ina is not Emacs. And there was mince for mince is not complete Emacs. <laughs> 